Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about pedagogy. Uh, Ted Sizer, who had a great effect on me in my life, once said that you can tell the pedagogy and philosophy of a school by looking at its allocation of time, space, people, and resources. And of course, there's more to it than that. But every school has a theory, and it does have a pedagogy, even if you meet a principal who, when you ask them what the pedagogy is or what the philosophy of the school is, says, what do you mean it's a school? It has one. It's like there's always weather. There's always a philosophy. There's always a pedagogy. So some people seek uh, a traditional pedagogy, a classical pedagogy, uh, as based on the Committee of Ten's work in 1893 or the Carnegie Commission of 100 years ago, and these different entities that basically said, we're going to take content and we're going to put it into four disciplines, English, history, math, and science, and most people think, yeah, English, history, math, and science, I mean, what else could it be? Well, what about the ar archaeology, anatomy, anthropology, um, and astrophysics? Um, so uh, really, um, there's something arbitrary about the decision that they made and the decision to do biochem and physics and to do biochem and physics in that order, which has great consequence because physics can also be elemental. And we have a system in the United States where only 9 to 10 percent of kids take something that is on some level elemental because they don't make it to physics. So let's go to high tech high. In high tech high, we look at things a little bit differently. We teach conceptual physics earlier. Um, we think that the disciplines should be more integrated. Of course, we still are stuck with English history, math, and science in a sense because we have to have transcripts. We want our kids to get into college, so we're preparing them to change the world, but also to be part of it. That's a paradox for all of us. So you can't totally leave the reservation in terms of the content, but you can leave it largely, but you need to describe it very well in terms of what kids have done when they're applying to college. So here, we have people working in teams. Here we think that teacher loyalty should be a little bit less to the content that they teach and more towards who else teaches the same kids at the same time. Why do I say that? Because in terms of professional development, in terms of team planning, I could be a math teacher and in most schools five afternoons a year I'll just meet with other math teachers and I don't know how much math teachers have to talk about. There's something, but not that much. But the other people who are teaching the kids the same age as the students I'm teaching, um, I've got a lot to talk about, about uh, who the kids are and also how we're going to integrate the disciplines in some way that they are coherent. Because when we go someplace on a trip, we don't come back from the trip and then talk to our friends about it and talk about here's the mathematical part of my trip, here's the social studies part, here's the English part, and here's the historical part. We experience the world as a whole and yet we artificially fragment content. Some people, in terms of their pedagogy, feel very comfortable doing that. I've certainly attended schools like that. I've worked in schools like that. That's one way to do it. Here we're trying to do something else. So question the pedagogy of what is the methodology. We, again, here think that we want a constructivist pedagogy where people are making things that weren't there before because there's great satisfaction inherently in making things that weren't there before. If it's a piece of art, if it's a mathematical equation, if it's a film like we're making right now, we're making a MOOC, or if you're building something using various materials to do so. So in doing so, you really get a, a, an immense satisfaction that you might not otherwise get. So. We do projects. Why projects? Because the whole idea of observation, reflection, documentation, and exhibition are really central to making this film, making this MOOC, building a house, uh, creating a school. So observation, reflection, documentation, and exhibition are sort of very simple ways of looking at the world. Some people call it project-based. You can call it whatever, but it's still the gratification of making things, and the exhibition is really important because that's how families and the public get to see what you are doing. It really is gives new meaning to public accountability. It gives new meaning to transparency. It gives new meaning to parent participation in schools by making the walls of the school and the, and, and the world outside of the school more permeable so that we're accustomed to having people come in. And if I'm a new teacher 
and two other teachers have everybody looking out at exhibition night at their students' work and not that much on mine, then all of a sudden I'm thinking, because I'm sensitive and I'm human, I think, well, I want people looking at my work and my students' work. How come they're not? Well, I'm going to look at Patrick's work over there. It's really, really good, and that's kind of good. And Kay's work over there, that's really interesting. What can I take from what Kay's doing or Patrick's doing so that the next time I can do it better myself? So whatever your pedagogy, you want to build in this whole idea of a cycle of improvement of making it better the next time and not just sitting back on your laurels. So think about pedagogy. It's history, it's content, it's sequence, and what you're going to do with it. Don't take for granted everything that's handed from you on down from on high.